This is CGTN, China Global Television Network. Next on Big Story, migrants escaping violence are often victims of more violence. Ya no, si te están hablando o amenazándote de que ellos me tienen todavía, ya no des dinero, mamá. And confront a long journey under the worst conditions. Facing dangers from armed vigilantes who view them as criminals. They're flooding us with fentanyl, which is killing our people. So they're a terrorist organization. And law officers prone to abuse. They broke the window to the back of his vehicle through the tear gas agent. He was forced out of the vehicle and shot 22 times. Victims of a system that is broken. I'm breaking down as much as I was the day of his funeral. I'm reacting the same way, and it's because I, I don't think I've truly healed at all. A community in fear because of the color of their skin. Anybody that looked my color, looked dark, would have get stopped. Even for those who make it, success remains elusive. Latino kids had something like a 40% dropout rate from high school. We are situated in the economy in such a way that we have a higher poverty rate than other groups. The race gap in the U.S. Hispanics. Next on Big Story. numbers released late this afternoon show detentions and arrests at America's southern border hit an all-time high in 2021. In a federal court filing Tuesday, ACLU lawyers argued that the government was still separating families, quote, based on such offenses as traffic violations, misdemeanor property damage, and disorderly conduct violations. Mi trabajo es en pintura y también trabajo ahora, tengo dos trabajos, trabajo sábado y domingo en un restaurante. Trabajo los siete días a la semana, son, uh, trabajo ocho horas diario, uh, sábado y domingo diez horas. Me toca duro, pero pues por mi familia es, hay que hacerlo. Like thousands of people threatened by gang violence, Miguel Amaya fled its native El Salvador three years ago for the United States in search of security and a better life. Amaya survived a perilous 800-mile journey through drug cartel territory and crossed the U.S. border illegally. When he reached California, he sent for his family, but they were not as lucky. Caught by U.S. immigration agents, Amaya's wife and daughter were separated as part of the U.S. immigration zero-tolerance policy. La gente de ICE me habló como a las 8 de la mañana. A mi esposa se quedó en la cárcel federal um, y por mi hija me hablaron como a las 8 de la noche que ella estaba en un albergue. His wife, Yoselin, was locked up in Texas and it took two weeks to locate his eight-year-old daughter, Michelle. La primera llamada fue de 20 minutos y ella estaba como siempre llorando, llorando, que me decía que papá que la sacara de ahí, que ella quería estar con con su mamá y conmigo, pues, pero 
pero que se sentía, se sentía, se sentía sola y que, que la sacara de ahí, que, pero, ah. Esa es la única vez que está separado mi esposa de mi hija, bueno, mi esposa de mi hija, pues, de, después de, um, ¿qué? Siete años tenía, y ahora, hoy que tiene ocho años, otra vez más, que es como una pesadilla. Uh, hoy llegó la noticia que va a ser deportada a su país, a uh, Bueno, El Salvador. Ella está bien triste y siempre dice como que ella no se quiere separar de, de, de su hija y quiere que estemos los tres juntos y, y pues está triste y siempre está como diciendo que, que es su hija lo más importante y pues nuestra familia es lo más importante y está pues devastada. Each year, thousands of migrants caught by authorities are locked up in detention centers to be deported back to the misery they fled. The detention of migrants, I think, is a really good example that there are entanglements that have to do with the law, entanglements that have to do with politics, and frankly, that don't, that don't make a lot of sense. And all of that results from the fact that we are living with a set of laws that hasn't been reformed in decades, is outdated and inadequate for the challenges that we face at our border. There are human beings paying the price for that, for our failure to fix our policies. Hispanic drivers were 32% more likely than white drivers to be ticketed and were 25% less likely than white drivers to get off with a warning. We've seen racial targeting, we've seen racial profiling, we've seen implicit bias. Migrants are easy targets for racially motivated abuse. But more established Latinos who have been in the U.S. for generations are not immune either. In Los Angeles County, California, a large and disproportionate number have been slain by police for nonviolent crimes. Temper Coffee Vehicle is stuck on the train tracks for South Santa Ana. Last September, Brandon Lopez was shot and killed after a three-hour standoff with Anaheim police officers who thought he had a gun. He was unarmed and going through a mental health episode. We're getting brand new details tonight on a dramatic and deadly end to a standoff in Santa Ana. We brought you last night as breaking news. As I walked under the yellow line and introduced myself, I had my hands up. I gave them my full name. Um, I gave them my title. Um, let them know I was a council member and that this is my district and that I'm also a mental health professional. And I said, it's my understanding he's been in the car for you know, quite some time. I said, this is a, a mental health situation that we need to de-escalate. And I said, look, I'm trying to help you guys do your job today. I said, I'm trying to make sure my cousin doesn't get killed. And her response was, people kill people every day, was the exact words. And I just remember feeling appalled by that response. And I pointed at her and I said, but you'll get away with it. And she goes, if you're so concerned about saving people, why don't you tell your neighbors to go inside? And there was children and moms and families watching. And I just said, shame on you. Officers arrived in military gear, in large numbers, rifles out. I mean, once they were on site, we knew that this was going to be fatal. They broke the window to, his back, to the back of his vehicle um, through the tear gas agent. He was forced out of the vehicle and shot 22 times. This violence seen playing out hours after a SWAT team was called in for a standoff with a robbery suspect who had led police on a pursuit in a stolen car. Tonight, the city of Santa Ana says the man in the car was Brandon Lopez. He was shot and killed, and tonight we learn he's cousins with Santa Ana Council Member Jonathan Ryan Hernandez. After shooting him 22 times, they deployed one non-lethal um, bullet at his lifeless body. So they had the willpower to fire one shot non-lethal after firing 22 lethal. This is a typical case of shoot first, ask questions later. It concerns me that both Santa Ana and Anaheim PD 
didn't have the inability to recognize a firearm. And that at the end of the day, my cousin Brandon was killed over a water bottle. I wouldn't wish this upon any family. It's, it's one of the most challenging forms of grief and, and trauma I think families can process. He was our son, he was, our, he was a father, he was a brother. He had many attributes. Look at that smile. That smile's infectious. Everybody that knew Brandon talked about his smile. Just hearing and seeing everything that they're saying about him is, is so wrong. They didn't know Brandon. They just think he's another Hispanic with tattoos, shaved head, and it doesn't matter to them. Hernandez says he and the rest of the family have been aggressively harassed for demanding justice. I got a phone call today. This person is a close friend to law enforcement, and the person told me to stop talking about this publicly if I wanted to stay in office. And a lot of people don't know, but choppers, their flight paths are public. And this is Anaheim's flight path. And this is right over my house, right over my uncle's house, which is Brandon's father, and right over the crime scene at 2 a.m. November 1st. So police not only take those you love from you, but the same department that does it follows and tracks family members that speak up. As of last June, 465 Latinos have been killed by police since 2000 in LA County alone, according to a database compiled by the Los Angeles Times. Nationally, more than 900 Hispanics have been killed since 2015. My justice is all the cops that were involved that shot my brother 22 times. I want all of them to be part of the trial, and I want all of them to be put in jail and brought there for the rest of their lives and feel the pain that their family knows that they will never be able to hug or touch them again is the same pain that we have with my brother. What are we going to do to, to change how the responses are happening? Um, and unfortunately, black, black and brown communities are predominantly the communities that are having these things happen to them. We do, in the United States, expect the police system, the law enforcement system, to catch a lot of the problems that we create through other failures, right? The failure of our educational system to provide a high quality education to every child in the United States creates problems that we then, frankly, expect the police and the judicial system to clean up. We can do much, much better than that. The Southern Poverty Law Center says extremist vigilante groups are targeting migrants and humanitarian organizations at the southern border. Uh, all right, run up to camp. Mobile two, sheepdog, you got a cop. Lewis Arthur is the founder of Veterans on Patrol, a volunteer militia that patrols the Sonoran Desert for undocumented migrants. So red is a sovereign nation, and this is where you have a majority of your drugs, sex trafficking, violent trafficking, a lot of this, child dumping in San Miguel. This is where you have most of it. Arthur insists he's not a racist, but on a mission to stop Mexican cartels that exploit migrants for sex trafficking and drug running. They're raping and abusing the women and children. They're murdering people. They're flooding us with fentanyl, which is killing our people. So they're a terrorist organization. And these people, everyone had to pay the cartel. They've reported that. And the problem you have is you'll have the criminal element that crosses, that goes out and murders Americans. They'll go out and rape our children. They'll go out and do horrible crimes, but they make a small percentage of the total of the people coming across. If you're putting a bullet in anyone's head, it's, it's a coyote who's raping a little girl under that tree. And if they're being raped and you got a clear shot, you do whatever you can and save that child. The forces of evil are so tangible and present here. We have an opportunity that's been given to us to intervene and pull those people out Death doesn't scare me. 
I'm not fearful of death. If I die, I get to see my creator. If I live, I get to live to serve him, so. Arthur is an ex-convict and not a veteran, but his organization has attracted veterans and support from right-wing fringe groups to stop what they call a migrant invasion. The border's important because this is, this is our country. Um, even God talked about borders, you know. Uh, we are a culture different than other cultures, and if we bring so many people in from different cultures, they're going to bring yeah, theirs in. The government's not going to do it. We, the people, need to stand up, go down there, and we need to, we need to have a heart for the innocent, and we need to protect. There is no criminals coming through those holes in the wall right now because men are protecting. They're not being arrogant asses who hate anybody. They're saying, this is our country, and we don't want the drugs, and you will not come in and take our children. So this individual, there's 11 other that way. They came running to move south, to run back, because Border Patrol was positioned up there chasing the group. They're on their way to get this guy right now. He's from Guatemala. We don't know his history or background, but they came running through a child dumping area. He says he doesn't know where the women and children are. We've assisted thousands of, and stopped hundreds of criminals. So actually, the we've actually assisted more of the ones who don't mean us harm than we've stopped the ones coming through, but we've also stopped more of the ones that mean us harm than anyone has in the history. My nombre is Lewis. Lewis. And we have the most turn-ins to Border Patrol, most drugs turned in, most trail cam footage, all that. Yeah, we're tailing them right here. There's no evidence backing Arthur's claim that they've stopped sex traffickers, but his team has delivered groups of migrants to Border Patrol authorities. Hey, Betsy. Betsy, tell them there's no need to run because Border Patrol's coming and they'll find them either way. What the media says about the Border Patrol agents is a lie. They'll be like, oh, they're a bunch of racists. I'm like, there's not a racist bone in these guys. Even old cowboy you see out there with the cowboy hats, he loves them. And when he sees the kids, he's just, you know, he's that cool cowboy, tall cowboy, you know, but there's no hatred. There's no racism in their hearts. But federal agents operating on the Mexican border have long been accused of mistreatment by asylum seekers and migrants. Unsealed government documents acquired by Human Rights Watch last year reveal shocking incidents of physical abuse. From child sexual assault and threats of rape to enforced hunger and brutal detention conditions. Whistleblowers say these are not isolated incidents, but part of a pattern that's representative of a cruel and violent work culture. The whole history of the Border Patrol, which they don't teach us in the academies, from racism, from white supremacy, from KKK, the Border Patrol agents are taught that the asylum seekers are liars, that the majority of them are criminals. Jen Budd is a former Border Patrol agent. She was sexually assaulted as a trainee and eventually resigned in protest over systemic racism and abuse. They know they can't complain, and especially nowadays because the majority of people crossing the border are asylum seekers. So their fear is, if I complain about this Border Patrol agent offering to go out on a date and this and that, or I complain that he sexually assaulted me, it's going to affect my asylum claim. Bud says the women who do dare to speak up about abuses are dismissed or silenced. I think the Border Patrol clears like 99% of their sexual assault allegations from migrants. It's just, you know, if if you get the time wrong or an agent's name wrong or, or something like that, then it's like, oh, well, unsubstantiated, unsubstantiated. And they just, just troll through it really fast. And nobody cares because they're migrants and they can't vote and they don't give politicians money, so they don't have a voice. Just nobody cares. Immigration officials are investigating allegations that a young girl was beaten and abused at a Texas detention center. Victims can rarely count on a justice system that they see as holding Latino immigrants in low regard. Uh, hola. Bueno, sí, habla Laura Peña. ¿Con quién hablo? Con Miguel Amaya. Hola, Miguel. Yo soy una abogada de inmigración. 
Miguel Amaya receives a call from an immigration lawyer with an update on his wife and daughter. Okay. Okay. Um, yo quiero que los tres estemos juntos. Mi hija también quiere que los tres estemos juntos. Sí, en, 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 este, en este caso, lo que yo estoy explicando, eh, um, diciendo es que vamos a pelear la deportación de su esposa okay. mientras su hija está reunificado con usted okay. y vamos a pedir que el gobierno no deportan a su esposa pero que, que está reunificado con usted y su hija en California ok, ok ¿Qué información ha dado a, al gobierno? Ah, para la niña me pidieron pues mi, como mi ID de El Salvador mi, o mi pasaporte. Yo di mi pasaporte y di mi dirección donde vivo. Um, eh, me pidieron también un, como un recibo de, de mi domicilio donde vivo. Y pues, uh, pues eso es todo. Y una, bueno, eso. Una, okay. Across the U.S., thousands of migrants and asylum seekers who are apprehended along the border languish in a vast network of prisons and for-profit detention centers. Hidden from view, they're subject to neglect and abuse that includes beatings, frigid temperatures, and a lack of health care. A nonprofit group filed a complaint against the Department of Homeland Security for sexual assault, abuse, and harassment in federal detention centers. Last year, more than 40 immigrant women filed a complaint against a gynecologist, alleged to have performed hysterectomies on them while in federal custody, without their fully informed consent. If that can happen, everything happens. The mistreatment, the sexual abuse and assault, the, the, you know, it, it all exists because we permit it, because we refuse to look. We don't even look at our homeless brothers and sisters next to us, much look want to look through those prison walls. Let's end our exhausting war of immigration. President Biden pledged to roll back Trump's immigration policies but the plight of migrants has hardly changed. Today, some 22,000 people are in detention, 7,000 more than under Trump. It has just gone to the most unprecedented levels ever. Even when people were not crossing, we've had the high militarization of the border. And once we have people crossing, if you live, then you're gonna get prosecuted now for illegal entry in these programs that we've established along the border that cost the taxpayer millions and millions of dollars to prosecute people for the very crime that we've caused them to commit, unlawful entry. And we're one of the only few countries that criminalizes that physical act of migration. We're the only country that you know, does this physical separation of, of children. We have really gone to the depths of our inhumanity. This morning, the record surge in unaccompanied migrant children at the southern border is overwhelming government facilities, leaving almost all the beds taken. But the White House continues to say it is not a crisis. No dual process. The same way they get arrested, they go back to a different town with more danger. Because if they got arrested in a different border town where they get spilled, they don't belong to that cartel. They belong to the other cartel, so they have to pay this one to get out from that town. So they go through a lot. Dora Rodriguez is a Salvadoran immigrant living in Arizona. 
who founded a nonprofit to support vulnerable migrants and asylum seekers. Border Patrol is supporting so many people in the town of Sasa de Sonora, in Nogales, in Agua Prieta, in every port that we know. So what they're doing is they take all their belongings and they put them in plastic bags and trash bags. So we decided that we're going to fight this back by creating dignity bags because there is no human that should be thrown away from this country with a plastic bag. It's inhumane, it's criminal, and it shouldn't be happening. Dora's friend, Gail Kosorek, shares videos of migrants who were kidnapped by drug cartels after being deported to the Mexican side. Hola, mamá. Solo quiero decirte, mamá, que, que estoy bien, mamá. Pero, por favor, ya no, no, si te están, si te están hablando o amenazándote de que yo me tienen todavía, ya no des dinero, mamá. Ahorita, gracias a Dios, unas personas nos vieron y nos arrimaron víveres, mamá. Pero quiero que sepas, mamá, que estoy muy bien, gracias a Dios. Estoy muy bien. Y ya no, 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 por nada no les des nada de dinero ya, mamá, porque simplemente... Nos mintieron, nos dijeron que sí, que si regresábamos para México, nos iban a matar, mamá. Several times a month, Dora and Gil drive down to Mexico to deliver aid to a shelter they open for migrants. The drive takes them through harsh desert where the remains of hundreds of migrants are found each year. You know, in this area of the, the valley of close to Tucson, <clears throat> we really have a graveyard behind us. So how can you ignore that? If you get lost, it can take you two weeks. Week, two yeah. weeks, but by then, you're, you're not equipped to do this walk. Most of our migrants run out of water within the third day. Their phones don't work anymore. They have no shoe, no food, and their feet get destroyed. Dora speaks from experience. In 1980, she was a 19-year-old student when she fled El Salvador's civil war to escape government death squads. After crossing into the U.S. with a smuggler, Dora and her group were abandoned in the desert, lost without water for days on end, 13 of the 26 migrants ended up dying. Dora was on the verge of death when she was rescued. They say within a half an hour, none of us would be alive because the temperatures were hot, they were horrible. In the ground, in the desert, even at night, they were 115, 120. That's how it gets in Arizona, it's very hot. So that's how I got here and that was, you know, God, time goes fast. This is 40 years ago already, 41 years. It's not yours, is it? All you have to do is tell me, is it yours? All these years later, Dora says official hostility toward Latino migrants has grown worse. There is no American dream. It doesn't exist. In Arizona, we had a law that it was a profile that SB 70, it was terrible because Anybody that looked my color, looked dark, would it get stopped? And it was a profile, you know, and they sent back thousands of people with that law in here because of that, because you look different. And you tell me there's no racist, right? Yes, it is. We don't understand our own history. And certainly the country doesn't understand us or our history. We are not taught it, even in parts of the United States where our roots go back 500 years. We are still struggling to teach our own history, the history of our presence in the United States. And I'm convinced that it's more difficult to make progress when we don't understand our history. Because of the drought at Honduras, Darwin Colindres was forced to leave his family. This is Darwin's wife, Berta. 
the mother of his two girls, and a baby on the way. Berta says Darwin would call every few days from the road as he made his way north. And then, somewhere outside McAllen, Texas, Darwin collapsed. The heat, the exhaustion proved too much. He went into cardiac arrest. A couple of weeks later, Darwin's body arrives home. The grief is measureless. There's new information tonight in the videotaped death of an undocumented immigrant at the San Isidro border crossing. Federal agents used batons and a taser gun on the father of five to subdue him. A mi esposo lo detuvieron este el 10 de mayo. Este tomó algo de una tienda, no tuvo cargos, lo deportaron. Pero creo que su delito más grande de él fue no tener documentos. Anastasio Hernandez Rojas, a father of five, suffered a fatal heart attack after he was beaten and tased by agents at the San Isidro crossing near San Diego. Ya cuando lo iban a deportar, o sea, lo empezaron a golpear. Oh my God. Lo golpearon, lo torturaron. He's not resisting, guys. Why you guys keep keep pressing on him? Pues a mi a mi esposo lo asesinaron. Pero hasta ahorita, este, las personas que lo asesinaron, este, están trabajando. Federal authorities at the scene erased video taken by eyewitnesses, but the attack was caught on film and broadcast on national television. No agents were charged or punished for the killing. Border Patrol has the legal authority by Congress to investigate. Uh, to a certain extent, immigration crimes, narcotics crimes, and customs issue crimes. But we cannot investigate ourselves at use of force. You can't investigate when your agent rapes somebody. You can't investigate domestic violence because you don't have those authorities. You don't have that training. So what the Border Patrol has done is they've created basically what is a cleanup crew. And that's why there have been no Border Patrol agents ever held accountable for shooting anybody, and there's been a lot of questionable ones. One farm worker who did not want to share his name for fear of losing his job said they had little to no information about the coronavirus. He says he doesn't want to worry about it because his only option is to go to work. More than half of the farm workers in the U.S. are Hispanic. I try to provide them uh, with a mask if they, if they come or it's tear or if I see it that it's, it's dirty or I have some with me and I offer them, you know, I give them a clean one. So we have to take care from every angle that we can.
striking grape pickers from Delano began a 300-mile pilgrimage northward. Since the 60s, migrant workers have lacked educational opportunities for their children, lived in precarious housing conditions, and faced discrimination and violence when asking for fair treatment. In 1962, Dolores Huerta founded the United Farm Workers Labor Union. We say, you cannot close your eyes and your ears to us any longer. You cannot pretend that we do not exist. You cannot plead ignorance to our problems because we are here and we embody our needs for you. And we are not alone. Huerta led nonviolent labor strikes and faced repression, arrest, and prosecution. Farm workers are out there in the sun all day long. Uh, yeah, they are exposed, and uh, again, with, with the pesticides, they, they are subjected to cancer, uh, but then again, uh, they're, they're subjected to their skin being exposed all of the time, and, and also, you know, heat exposure, because it gets so hot that every year we have farm workers that die just from the heat. They don't speak English, and they speak different dialects also, and sometimes they don't know the laws that protect them. And so this is where some of that bad behavior by the foreman or, or the labor contractors that, that keeps going on, the women are sexually harassed. We need to have those ethnic studies at the kindergarten level and at, at the, with the first graders, because little children, they are not born racist. They become racist by the culture that they grow up in, the values that their parents have. So the only way that we can change this is to teach children at the elementary school level that you know, we are one human race and that people should not be discriminated because of their color or their gender. Good morning, boys and girls. Good morning, Mr. Rosso. Latino kids had something like a 40% dropout rate from high school. So education remains a big challenge. Our economic status remains a big challenge. There is still high poverty in the Latino community and poverty in our community is not defined by lack of work. It's defined by where we are situated in the workforce. We are more likely to be in two-parent families where both parents are working and also still be poor. And that has to do with what kind of jobs we have, the quality of those jobs, the wages of those jobs, and the extent to which those jobs attach to benefits like paid time off when you're sick, resources to save for retirement. We are situated in the economy in such a way that we have a higher poverty rate than other groups. After weeks of searching and months of separation, Miguel Amaya is finally going to be reunited with his daughter, Michelle. Hoy es el gran día, el más esperado. Hoy, hoy sí ya viene mi hija. Bueno, ya está volando. Para acá llega las a las 9 y 9 el vuelo aquí a Oakland y pues esperando ese gran día y estoy muy feliz por eso y, y me siento como el día que me despedí cuando decidí venir a, este, a este país y así me siento ahora <ríe> de nuevo volver a ver a mi hija eso no no sé cómo explicarlo estoy muy pero muy feliz Yes. 
¿Sí te gusta? ¡Te quiero mucho! Yo te quiero más, princesa. Mira, ya te compramos esas cosas. Ella era de Salvador, igual que yo. Ella de Honduras y ella de Guatemala. Éramos cuatro nada más. Y esta tiene cinco años, siete años, ocho años. Acá estábamos en el baño. Esta es la señora que los cuidaba. Y ahora ya, ya tiene vuelo para El Salvador y pues este, ella está esperando para el 25 que la manden para allá, pero estamos checando a ver con unas abogadas a ver qué, qué se puede hacer todavía. Pero pues si ella dice que no se puede hacer nada, pues se va para El Salvador. Too frequently, the victims are unarmed and dealing with mental health problems. Another controversy for the LA County Sheriff's Department, Sheriff Alex Villanueva expressing, quote, grave concerns following the deputy-involved shooting of 34-year-old David Ordaz Jr. Ordaz was having an episode in front of his East LA home. His sister warned a 911 dispatcher that he was suicidal and might try to provoke a deadly use of force. Are you so secure? Uh, I don't know. I mean, no matter what, this is my brother. Yes, I understand. And it's good that you guys called and that you know, you're trying to help him, help him out. But when sheriff's deputies arrived at the scene, the situation escalated. Hey, step out of the car. Yeah. Hey, put the knife down, dude. Put the knife down. Hey, we're not here to shoot you, dude. We're trying to help you out. Why are you upset today? Why do you want us to shoot? Soon after Ordaz moved to the sidewalk, a deputy requested permission to fire a stun bag. Hey, Sarge. Leave it. Get back. hit him with one. Yeah. Too close. Step back. Step hey, back. Hey, stun bag. 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 Ordaz was shot 12 times. Experts concluded he posed no threat to the deputies. This isn't normal because, I mean, people in our society now treat it like it is, like it's this, it's this normal thing. Well, they're police officers, so it's, it's fine if they just kill, you know, murder somebody. And it's not even like, it's like, Remy Pinada is a cold-blooded murderer. I mean, to, I mean, have you seen the video? Like, my dad was in pain. He was in pain. He was shot 11 times at that point and holding on for dear life. I mean, hold, literally holding himself. And even cop supporters agree that he was in the complete wrong. That show, that means something, right? Like for people that are blue lives matter and you know, for even them to admit that he executed my dad, It sucks that I could go on YouTube and like look up my dad's name and find videos of him being killed like it's normal, you know? And that's what I, that's what I was saying. It's like this whole other monster because who, there's not many people that you know that could look up their father's name, their brother's name, their uncle's name and find a video of them being killed in cold blood, you know? The four sheriff's deputies who shot and killed Ordaz are still employed by LA County. I find myself looking at pictures and forgetting, like, they're pictures that we use so often that I'll forget, like, my dad's gone, this is my dad. And you forget sometimes, because you're so lost in fighting for him that you forget, and you have to remind yourself. <laughs> you have to remind yourself of who he was. And I was telling my mom this earlier too that I don't think anybody ever heals from this. I think we just distract ourselves enough because I find times where I'm not doing anything and I'll just sit and I'll think about him and it's like I'm breaking down as much as I was the day of his funeral. The day I found out, I'm like, I'm reacting the same way and it's because I, I don't think I've truly healed at all. David's older sister, Hilda, says their parents emigrated from Mexico more than 30 years ago to give their children better opportunities. 
My dad didn't know the language. My dad didn't have as much family as we have now. Um, he had to work double, um, you know, no education. And he was able to purchase these homes. And my parents would have rather lived in Mexico their entire life, knowing that their family was gonna be good and healthy because, you know, all of this trauma now has given all of us PTSD and not have their son. They'd rather be poor and be alive in Mexico than be here and have gone through all of this. I'm sure they do. I'm sure they do, you know. Frankly, our failure to provide adequate health care creates problems. Our failure to provide mental health care is a great example, creates problems that we then expect the police to fix and the police fix it using the tools that they have, and those are the wrong tools, and they are incredibly hurtful. So the first migrant that I encountered in here was in this spot right here, and it was a Salvadorian guy from La Union. That was my first experience, seeing a deportee. We cross, border patrol pull back, let people out, and this poor kid, oh my God, he had it to be 18, 17, I don't know. And he was standing in there with his shoes ripped up apart. He had blister, he was a mess. And it doesn't matter what country you are from, you are dumped in this town where it's nothing. Yeah. yeah. Dora Rodriguez's brush with death as a refugee changed the course of her life. After settling in Tucson, Arizona, she devoted herself to working on behalf of migrants. Este es de alma, donde están los luces. I go to Mexico, I deliver all these donations, I go and talk to people, you know, to, I call them my brothers and sisters, they want to come and, and they have the right to come and look for a better life and they have all the right to come at the border and ask for help because they don't feel safe. On the drive back to Tucson, Dora and Gail scanned the desert for migrants who might be lost. So this is um, this is our life. This is what we do, <laughs> you know. And this is good to be scouting around and looking for people. But this is where the big groups come through. And there's cameras here. You see the camera on the other side. Because this is a state, you know. And then they just step across. And and then they had 151 night, 80 a night. As a humanitarian, as an activist, I do not feel scared of the Border Patrol, really. But I am terrified with the militias, because they're crazy, you know, and they, they, they just don't care. For Dora, the fact that right-wing militias are allowed to operate freely along the border is a blatant sign of systemic racism. I just think it, if I am a Hispanic, I'm brown, you know, my accent and everything, I, you know, I get a group of me, my people, 10 of us, we get guns, we get stuff like that, we arm ourselves, we go to the border and trying to save the world because Border Patrol is not doing their job, guess what? We're gonna get arrested. We're gonna be in jail by the next day because I don't have blue eyes. I'm not a tall white person. And I know that's a fact. They'll run around back here doing their Mission Impossible. Mm -hmm. They've used this to hold their guns and, and shoot at certain points. They've uh, have it, it changes, but they'll run around out here and get a little gun practice in. But we send our soldiers to other borders. And we had them dying on foreign soil. They're in other deserts, dying for other nations, you know, under the American flag, but they're not allowed to come down here and protect our communities and secure our borders. You know, so it's all by design. With so many migrants crossing into the U.S., Lewis and his militia have no plans to leave the borderlands anytime soon. This operating area right here is your safety net. What gets past us down at that wall, it'll take you three to five days, depending on how we can flush you, to get up to this location. So we have another chance to get you. We have a chance to stop you at the wall. We have a chance in between here, 
because we know the routes and we have the ability to set up real-time cellular cameras to catch you as you come. I do see a path for the more humane treatment of migrants. It requires, however, engagement by the Congress of the United States. And at the moment, I do not see that path through the Congress, which it pains me to say. And we will have to fight very hard and probably very long to get there. complicado adaptarme, pero yo tenía mi familia, tenía mi hija, tenía mi esposo, entonces yo estaba completa. Following more than a year in detention, uncertain of whether or not she would be deported back to El Salvador, Miguel Amaya's wife, Yoselin, was granted asylum in the U.S. The family has since settled in Northern California, but the trauma of detention and a long, brutal separation lingers on. Llegamos a la cárcel y fuimos procesadas como criminales, la verdad como criminales, porque ahí había de todo. Los cerraban nuestro pelo, los quitaban nuestros zapatos, fuimos de, de, mmm, los desnudaron para revisarnos, los bañaron, este, tuvimos que cargar nuestras colchonetas, pusimos nuestros uniformes y todo un proceso criminal, la verdad porque fuimos a una cárcel criminal, no los podían tratar diferente que a los demás porque es una cárcel criminal. Fue un poco difícil, ¿verdad?, porque no sabíamos en qué lugar estaban nuestros hijos. Nosotros lo que queríamos saber y era que alguien nos explicara dónde estaban nuestros hijos. Entonces, separar a un hijo de una mamá es el peor castigo que puede existir en la vida. Si nuestros hijos son nuestros, es nuestra vida, es nuestra alma. Y separarnos es como matarnos en vida. It was scary because I never thought I was going to be separated from my mom because I really loved her and I couldn't like I couldn't live without her. She was like she was like my supporter, my everything, you know. And it was just really hard. Michelle este ella tuvo un proceso muy largo. Ella le pusieron psicóloga hasta en la escuela. Ella era una niña especial en la escuela por todo el proceso que ella estaba pasando porque Michelle y yo éramos Mamá y hija súper unidas. Nosotros no los podíamos separar y nunca nos habíamos separado. Entonces esa separación para nosotros fue súper difícil porque fue la primera vez que los habíamos separado. Ella está muy feliz de estar acá, súper feliz, pero si le preguntas qué ha pasado cuando la separaron, son cosas que ella creo que la tiene marcada en su vida. Ella se pone, se pone mal. Michelle is now in seventh grade. She says she's still adjusting to life in the U.S. and the judgment that comes with being a Hispanic immigrant. They just like be mean to them, like call them bad things, like they, like they be judging them by their weight or like their how their face looks like. And it's just really mean. And I thought it was gonna be like nicer. Not everybody has a lucky chance, like coming from another country to another one because a lot of people die coming in the journey. Dora remembers those who have died. Voy a decir el nombre y si me pueden acompañar a decir presente. Peralta Sukunai B. Wilmer, presente. Jose Montoya Suarez, presente. Herbert Sanchez Gomez, presente. Carlos González Arevalo, Presidente. Romeo Perez Ramirez, Presidente. Our policies are policies of death. Social death, where you're deported, and you have to raise your child from when they're in Chicago and you're in Mexico. And many times that social death becomes a physical death, and so there's the physical death. And the third one is the ambiguous death, which is really the majority of people that we're dealing with and remembering on a daily basis of who's dying out there in the desert, right? And the majority of them are unknown. I'm a woman, and the Declaration of Independence was written by men for men, and it was written by white men for white men. But the ideals apply to me as an Hispanic woman, for sure. And I believe in fighting for those ideals. That is the essence of what this country is supposed to be about. And I think it is a mistake to become so cynical that we forget to fight for the ideals. Oh,
This country didn't value people of color. And eventually, that hate for black people evolved into hate for brown people. But it's gonna take us, those that have been oppressed systemically, to change it. And the, the most heartbreaking truth of that is that we have to do it broken. We have to do it after you gun down family members. We have to show up to these fights after you put you know, your, your child in a cage and, and separate you from it. Those are the freedom fighters. It's the people that have lost everything. Thank you.